All right. I made this recording in case you are getting kicked off of Google Classroom or the Google Meet, okay? So just go ahead and listen through it and then you can complete your assignments. So um, welcome back. Um, happy Monday. Please complete your bell work. Uh, it shouldn't take you but a couple of minutes. You're going to look back in the RELS assignment that you completed and you're going to plug your answers into the blank like a Mad Lib to um, create your own class statement. OK, so mission statement. So then I'm going to look through, pick out the ones I like, and I'm going to have you all vote on the best one later. So go ahead and do your bell work. It'll only take you a few minutes. Um, but you need to make sure you always go back and submit it in Google Classroom. So um, if you don't, I don't, won't know you turned it in. So even if you submit the Google form like you're supposed to, it uh, won't show me that you did it. OK, so just a heads up on that. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Please turn your assignments in on time. If for some reason you have problems, like internet problems, let me know. The best way to get a hold of me is remind. Uh, I, I apologize if I have missed any of your messages or emails. I promise I'm not ignoring you. If I don't respond to you in a timely manner, send me a message on remind, okay? Because I just need to see it. And I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, oh, and another thing, the thing about turning the assignments on on time, if you have one Thursday that's due Friday, but you don't tell me you're having issues until Saturday, I've already marked you absent because it's due on Friday. So that way, if you tell me ahead of time you're having problems, maybe we can work out a way for you to still do your assignment so you won't get behind, okay? Anyway, um, every time you log on to Google Meet, Type hello in the chat box so I can double check it for attendance, okay? All right, split screens. Um, that's the best way when we are looking at a presentation, but you're working at the same time. It's the best thing to do if you can. So here's your the top of the tabs, okay? So this right here, it either looks like a box or it'll look like the little ones here. That's the window size, okay? So when you go up in the top right hand corner of your um, page that you're looking at, you want to make sure it's minimized so it's not taking up the whole screen. And you want to have the two things that you want to look at in two different windows. If you have two tabs side by side here and you split the two apart, you can go on one Double tap with two fingers, not double tap, but use two fingers, press down on the mouse pad, and then you can choose to move the tab to a new window, okay? So you're going to have to have two windows set up already that are small. So use two fingers, click on the second tab, and then move them apart. So you got one here and one here. When you get that far, you'll have this, and you'll see the little arrows. So if you hold down on the arrow and then let off, it's going to move the first tab to the left and lock it there. And then when you go to the other one and you hold down on that arrow at the top and then let go, it'll move it to the right and lock it. So then you can look at two different things at the same time. Now you can move the w windows to the spots you want them, but um, it adjusts the screen size when you actually do it properly. Okay. Moving on. Okay, so we're going to go over a vignette today. Uh, it's called My Name, and it's pulled from the book called The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cineros. Hopefully I pronounced her name correctly. Um, so uh, you have an exit slip, so I would recommend doing it at the end of class uh, because it is uh, review questions, okay? So do it when the story's fresh in your mind. But it's not going to be due until tomorrow at 3 p.m. So if you need to wait till tomorrow, you can. What is a vignette? A vignette's just a short scene, okay? So it's nabbed out of the book, um, or it's a short scene in itself, and it captures a single moment or a defining detail about a character, idea, or other element of the story, okay? What is a character? And this should be review, but in case you need a refresher, uh, a character um, pretty much are just the people in the story who take part in the action. It's important to know it can also be the narrator, but not always, 
Okay, so if it's just a narrator who's telling a story about other people um, from an outside point of view, that is not a character. But if the character is telling you a story about their own life or something that happened to them, the narrator is now a character. Okay, so characters display certain qualities and character traits that develop and change over time. And that is really what makes uh, books exciting to read or stories exciting to read is that change, that character change, okay, development. And usually they have motivations or reasons for their behaviors. It would be kind of lame if you didn't know why someone was doing something in a story, right? Plot um, is a series of events in a story which usually center on the conflict or struggle faced by the main character, okay? Okay. So what happens here? What happens next? What happens next? How, um, what's the resolution? You know, what was the conflict again? All that stuff's part of the plot, okay? Setting. Setting is the time and place in which the action takes place. It's also the cultural environment. So if you've ever read 1984 um, or Fahrenheit 451, I think those are numbers. I always have to double check what the titles are with the numbers in, in them. But anyway, so those are dystopian novels. Okay, so um, it's said in the future, um, something apocalyptical has happened. Okay, so it's post-apocalypse. And usually they have um, defining elements in their setting and um, theme. Okay, so um, part of the setting could be like, Beat up buildings, crumbled down. There's no roadways anymore. Uh, cars are all stopped on the highway, run out of gas, and nobody's in them. Stuff like that, okay? So it sets up the setting. Sometimes you don't get a lot of details, though, and you got to use your imagination to plug those in. The last one we're going to cover real fast here is theme. What is theme? Well, Theme is the message about life or human nature that the writer shares with the reader. The reader must infer what the writer's message is. So the writer's not going to be like, look, you need to get this message from this uh, story or else, right? You got to figure it out yourself. And one way to do it is to apply the lesson learned um, to the main characters in, I mean, I'm sorry, apply the lesson learned by the characters to your own life. Okay, so think of what is it that Johnny learned in this story that I should take away from it. And that's a theme. Okay, so that's a good hint for you. Okay, so let's move on. You should have your assignment open by now. Okay, so I should have told you that earlier. But go ahead and open up your assignment. You can pause me if you need to to get it open. But um, you're going to fill in the I can statement. So here it is. I can identify the character setting and plot in a literature text to eventually find the theme. So eventually means that we are not expecting you to be masters of theme, uh, the perfect little theme spotters, like from the very get-go, okay? I said that kind of weird, but uh, it's okay if you're not um, a master at it, picking out the themes right from the get-go, okay? So we're going to focus on spotting um, characters, the setting, plot, things like that that give you clues to figure out the theme. And I mean, even like stuff in high school is difficult for me sometimes to pick out the theme. I really have to focus and look for context clues. So the material the material might get harder, but your skills will get better. So you'll be, hopefully, um, you'll get really good at picking out the theme. That's our goal, okay? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go over um, the first couple paragraphs with you. Okay, so I do. Um, this is my part. So, and again, this is called The Name, or My, my Name, and it's from The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cineros. Okay. In English, my name means hope. In Spanish, it means too many letters. It means sadness. It means waiting. It is like the number nine, a muddy color. It is the Mexican records that my father plays on Sunday mornings when he is shaving. 
songs like sobbing. Okay. So what I did, the first two things that stuck out to me is that her name means different things in different cultures. In English, it has a positive connotation and means hope. So it has a good meaning behind it, right? In Spanish, it has a negative connotation. So I underlined all the different descriptions she gave of her name in Spanish, which means negative connotation that, you know, it's kind of looked down upon, right? So then another detail I picked out is right here. It is. It is like the number nine. It means waiting. So I know this is present tense. So everything she's writing applies to her current life. So that's good to know. We don't know what time period it is, though, but we do know that it's centering on her current life. So then I move on. Mexican records. This stood out to me. Okay, If she's comparing her name in English and Spanish and then says that her dad plays Mex Mexican records, that uh, lets me infer that she is actually Mexican. And where she has had contact with different cultures, I'm assuming she's also an immigrant. Okay, so a Mex Mexican immigrant. That's what I'm inferring. Okay, so um, one other thing that stood out to me is when she's saying in Spanish, it means too many letters. It's like the number nine. And the more I thought about it, I thought, what does she mean? She has nine letters in her name. So I made a note of that down here, too. I don't know if this is right, correct, if I'm making the right inference, but I'm going to watch out for future clues to see if I'm right. Okay, so we're moving on to the next paragraph. It was my great-grandmother's name, and now it is mine. She was a horse woman, too, born like me in the Chinese year of the horse which is supposed to be bad luck if you're born female. But I think this is a Chinese lie because the Chinese, like the Mexicans, don't like their women strong. Okay, so first thing that stands out to me, it was my grandmother's name. Oh, yeah. So now we know where her name came from, what its origin is. Okay, so I put that in there. Second thing, horsewoman. What does that mean? Well, the imagery I get is with horses at first, right? I know that they're strong animals and that people have really high regard for them. So I applied what I knew, my background knowledge about horses, and tied it with the woman to get an image of a woman who's really strong and highly respected, okay? And as I read on at the end of the paragraph, she refers to the women as being strong. So that kind of verifies my impression of what a horsewoman is. Plus, as you read on, they were born in the year of the horse. So it's like a double whammy. It gives me good imagery, but it also backs it up and says why she's using that certain um, adjective. Okay, so Chinese year of the horse. So people who are born then should be strong. But then they add in, no, well, it's actually bad luck if you're female. And she doesn't think this is true. She just thinks the Chinese made it up because they don't want their women to be strong. Now, if the Chinese and Mexicans, because she adds those in, don't want their women to be strong, then that must mean they want their women to be weak. And they're not talking about physical strength. They're talking about the character of the woman, the way she is, her constitution, okay? So, from my own background knowledge, when I hear a woman referred to as a weak woman, it usually means that she can be controlled easily or she's easily manipulated. Okay, so that's the impression I get by applying my own background knowledge. So, what is obvious to me, what I can pull from this, is that the narrator has had um, interactions with Chinese and Mexican men um, that were negative experiences based on the fact that she was a woman or the people she knows were women, okay? So it's not necessarily true that every Chinese man she ran into treats women like this. It could just be one individual. But when something like this happens to you, 
it is easy to project your feelings on that one person to the group they identify with. Okay, that's how stereotyping happens. So um, we don't really know exactly what's going on with her other than she has had personal experiences that tell her that Chinese and Mexicans don't like their women strong. They want weak women. Okay, so what do I know so far? Well, she's a female Mexican immigrant, so she doesn't live in her native country, right? She um, is surrounded by sexism, and she has had uh, contact with different cultures, and they judge her by her name. And what I'm starting to picture is maybe she's in America, like New York or something like that, in a melting pot. So she's having contact with all these different cultures. That's just my own inferencing going on, okay, from context clues. So um, your turn. I want you to read the, pause me after I give you uh, instructions and go ahead and do this, okay? So I want you to pause me and then read the paragraph, right? Pick out two context clues that characterize the women of the story. And um, I want you to highlight the word or phrase that you want to make a note about. Then you hit insert and comment. So you're going to insert a note. And they call it comments. On the, and a little box will pop up on the right side of your screen. So when you find a context clue, highlight it with your mouse. Hit insert and then comment up at the top. And put a note in why you chose that context clues. Why is it important? Like, how does it characterize the women? Okay. So go ahead and pause me when you're done. Go ahead and hit play again. Okay. So these are the words that I picked out. Wild horse of a woman. That made me picture the narrator's grandmother as a free-spirited, strong, independent woman. Okay, um, the next one I picked out was Fancy Chandelier. Okay, so her grandfather threw a sack over her grandmother's head, carried her off, just like a fancy chandelier, gave her some guy, and got her married against her will. It forced her to do that, okay? And the narrator says, that's the way he did it. So my thoughts are, well... Okay, she was just carried off like a fancy chandelier, which is like a lamp. And, you know, if a person's being referred to as an object, it dehuman, uh, de dehumanizes them. I keep stuttering on that word, but that's okay, right? So, um, but yeah, taking away her human qualities to where she's an object. They just treat her how they want to treat her and don't, they don't care. And if that's just the way he did it, I'm like, did nobody stop him? What's up with this culture where that's acceptable? So it makes me wonder about the environment they're in. Because if that happened here in America, in our own society, that sucker would be in jail by now, right? So it kind of gives you a new perspective on where she grew up and the type of things that went on there. All right, so next paragraph, do the same thing. I'm going to have you pause me, find one context clue that characterizes the narrator and highlight the narrator's name because we are introduced to her, to her name in this paragraph. Go for it. All right, so here's what I found. There's the name right in front of you in blue highlights. Esperanza, okay? And the context clue I picked out is I don't want to inherit her place by the window. So if we're reading this paragraph, her grandmother's looking out the window her whole life, the way so many women sit, their sadness on an elbow. Like if you're leaning over and have your head resting on your hand and you're sad staring out the window wishing you had a different life. That's the type of image she's trying to get us to picture of her grandmother. And she's saying, I wonder if she made the best with what she got. Like did the grandmother eventually accept it and just move on with her life? Or was she sorry because she couldn't do all the things she wanted to be? So she's wondering... You know, did her grandma accept it or did she always regret what happened to her and never got past it? 
and let it rule her, her life because all her grandmother's dreams were stripped from her and taken away. So what's important here is Esperanza is saying, I don't want to inherit her place. Okay. I might have her name, but I'm not going to give up my dreams. I'm going to do what I want to do. I want to be me. Right. So moving on. Last two paragraphs. So pause me to do the same thing. In the fifth paragraph, um, I want you to find two context clues, probably with characterization, but if you find something important about the setting or plot, you can put that in there too. And then the sixth paragraph, I want you to pick out one context clue that characterizes the narrator, okay? If you want a challenge, try to connect ZZ the 10th to the first paragraph, okay? And I'll pause me and come back. Okay, so this is what I found, okay? So in that fifth paragraph, again, two cultures with two different impressions with her name, okay? So at their school, and I'm guessing it's American school. I'm not positive. But that's what I'm guessing. They say her name funny, like it was made out of tin. So it's coming out harsh out of their mouth, and they're having trouble saying it. And that makes me think I am probably saying her name wrong, Esperanza. Because she says in Spanish, her name comes out softer, like silk, whoops, silkier, okay? So how I'm pronouncing it probably is wrong. And it probably sounds a lot better said in Spanish. That's what she's saying, okay? So then she starts talking about Magdalena, her sister. And she says that, Magdalena can go home and be Nanny. So when you think about it, um, the identity that you have with your friends, who you are, how you act, what they call you, they can give you nicknames, is different than when you go home and you're around your family and your parents and pe other people you grew up with. They probably, um, they, you know, you, you act different. They probably treat you different and see you different, and they might use a different name. And what Esperanza is saying is that her name is her label. She can't get rid of it no matter where she goes. She will always be Esperanza. No one can see past that. Okay? So she can't change her identity. She's stuck in it. And people don't see the real her beneath it. And that's where this paragraph comes in. The last one. She wants to baptize herself, which is a way to renew yourself under a new name, a name like the real me, the one nobody sees. Nobody can see past her name. So she wants a new one like Lysandra or Mar Maritza or Zeze the 10th. Yeah, something like Zeze the 10th will do. And what's important here or a good little um crafty trick the narrator or the writer did is linking the number 10 back with the first paragraph where it said her name was like a number nine. So it's her way by giving her name a new number to um, let, let her imagine what it would be like just to have a new name. Okay. The end. Yay, we did it. So you have, I think, five comprehension questions at the bottom of this assignment. So go ahead and knock those out. Okay, if you have any questions, of course, uh, send me a message. It is always better to send it through Remind because it isolates the messages and I see it quick. Okay, otherwise, um, I mean, I'm getting like 100, over 100 <laughs> emails a day. So it might be a while before I can get back to you before I see it. Um, anyway. Finish those comprehension questions. You have like a meme picture type question at the bottom. Do that one too. You also have an exit slip I posted. So it would be good if you went ahead and did it because it's a review of the story we just went over and it'll be fresh in your mind. But you actually have until Tuesday at 3 p.m. to turn in the exit slip. So get your comprehension questions, um, get your assignment for today into me today by 3 p.m. So turn in your assignment today at 3 p.m. But the exit slip you can turn in tomorrow by 3 p.m.
Okay, so give me these as soon as you can. Just knock them out and get done with it. Um, tomorrow, if you didn't finish exit slip, like I said, go ahead and do it. You'll also have your very own vignette type activity to do where you get to reflect on your own name. And I'll give you instructions. I'll have a very brief video you can watch that'll go over that. Okay. Um, and then um, let's see here. Uh, again, exit slip. I put it twice here. You can see how much I want you to do that exit slip. So anyway, um, one more thing I'm going to have you do is check to see if you have some specific extensions I want you to use. You have to go through the Google Chrome store and hopefully it'll let you put it on um, your desktop. But let me know if it doesn't tomorrow. I'll have instructions and stuff there and stuff. So anyway, do your comprehension questions. Do the meme picture at the bottom. Turn in your assignment by 3 p.m. today. Tomorrow, you're going to have your own name activity. The exit slip due by 3 p.m. And I want you to try and put those extensions on your Chromebook. Okay? So be sure you watch the little video with instructions and then do all that stuff tomorrow. And I think that's it. We rocked it out. And, um, of course, let me know if you